Hello everyone, my name is Angelica, and together with Thalissa and Diana, we will discuss heritability concepts and the Bridger's equation. This is our second video produced for the discipline of quantitative genetics offered by the postgraduate program in genetics and plant breeding at the University of São Paulo, taught by Professor Antonio Augusto Franco Garcia. If you haven't watched our first video, where we talked about the decomposition of genotypic value, please access the link in the description. In the first video, we explained the decomposition of the genotypic value into additive and dominance effect for a single locus. In this video, we are going to learn concepts about heritability and the Bridges equation in the context of genetics and plant breeding. Let's remember some concepts seen in the first video. In this graph, we have the representation of the genotypic value, where the regression line represents the genotypic effect of the locus as a function of the number of copies of the dominant allele. The phenotype of an individual, that is, what we can observe, is a result of a set of components that can be divided into genetic and environmental. As seen in the last video, an individual's phenotype is equal to the genotype plus the environment effect. Through experiments, it is possible to estimate the phenotypic variance and, from this, the genotypic variance and the environmental variance as well. The phenotypic variance is related to the variance of a genotype obtained in M trails or environments and replicates by trail. Thus, we can understand that the phenotypic variance can be calculated from the genotypic variance plus the ratio between the variation of the genotype by environment interaction and the number of trails plus the ratio between the residual variance and the product of the number of trials and repetitions. When we divide the genotypic variance by the phenotypic variance, we are algebraically estimating how much of the phenotypic variation is due to genetic components. These coefficients we call heritability, which in general indicates how heritable a particular trait is. The origin of the study of heritability occurred with the analysis of a continuous dataset that relates the high trait of the parents with the high trait of the children. This study, conducted by Francis Galton in early 20th century, contributed significantly to the linear regression studies and genetic fields research. In this study, we can observe that taller parents tend to generate taller children. The slope of the line is denoted by alpha and may be called the genetic correlation or slope. This slope shows how much of the high trait is heritable from the parents to their children, which means how much of the phenotype is attributed to genetic causes, more precisely to the additive effects. Among all the interpretations that were made from this study, Persons pointed out that in the situation in which only the tallest parents can reproduce, we have that the average height of this subpopulation is greater than the average height of the original population. As seen in the graph, the children generated from this subpopulation may not be as taller as their parents, but the average height of these children will be greater than the average of the base population. In addition, the new average height of these children of the selected parents will be constant. That is, if selection by height is interrupted at this stage of genetic improvement, the new average will not regress to the average of the original height. In practice, heritability is a merger of the selection accuracy of the Bridger's equation. In this graph, the x-axis represent the average of the observations of the parents and in the y-axis the average of the observation of the progenies. m as the population mean and if there is no selection, the mean will remain the same. However, 
When we select the best individuals for a given trait, the average will change to MS, which denotes the new average of the selected individuals. It is worth remembering that not everything that was selected for MS will pass to the next generation, called M1, because part of that we see in the phenotype is due to the interaction of the genotype with the environment. The distance between M and M1 will depend on the slope of the line, which shows us the heritability. Note that a triangle was formed. The opposite side of the triangle is the difference between M and M1, which is denoted by G or genetic gain in cases where selection was performed. The adjacent side of this angle is the selection differential, denoted by S. And this is the difference between the population mean of the selected ones, denoted by MS, and the original population mean, denoted by M. The tangent of the angle is the alpha, also known as the slope of the regression line or the genetic correlation between the two generations. In this way, we can say that heritability is a fundamental parameter in quantitative genetics because it determines the response to genetic selection of superior individuals. This concept was first defined in animal breeding and later applied to plant breeding. Conceptually, heritability can be in the broad sense and in the narrow sense but the application of these concepts will be now be explained by Talisa. Let's talk now about the heritability. Imagine that you are a breeder conducting experiments to launch a new cultivar. So you are working with the multi-environmental trial, which is also called as MAP. Imagine that in a soybean breeding program, you arrive at final lines resistant to a specific pest. So for knowledge, if this characteristic is stable, it will be resistant to several field tests, right? Which must be tested in several environments. So several factors can interfere with these experiments, which are related to the experimental design. We will not be covering this now, but focusing on the genetic trait. How will you, the breeder, know that this trait will be maintained in the next generations? and in different environments. So according to Falconer and Mackey, the success of a characteristic in a population can be predicted only from a knowledge of the degree of correspondence between the phenotypic values and the breeding values. And this degree of correspondence is measured by the heritability. We will address the two different types of heritability the heritability in the broad sense and the heritability in the narrow sense. So heritability in the broad sense is equal to the genetic variance divided by the phenotypic variance of a population. As the name implies, all the genetic variance of the character in question is considered in the broad sense. We can also say that this variance allows us to know how much of the phenotypic variance in question is due to genetic causes. Taking or pest-resistant experiment in soybeans as an example, we can consider that the interactions of experiments in different environments can influence our results. So heritability in the broad sense must be predicted most reliable. For this, proper use of mixed models, for example, is an excellent way to arrive at unbiased results. But the best linear unbiased prediction can help with genomic predictions, and today we know the two ways for doing this, like estimating the marker effects, the RR blub, or by estimating the line effects, the G blub. So genomic best line, linear unbiased prediction, the G blub, for example, is a method that utilizes genomic relationships to estimate the genetic merit of individual. And this is very useful in the estimation of variance components and the genomic heritabilities. The heritability in the broad sense is also very used in clones like the potatoes. So we know that to quantify and the accuracy of maths, the best plans calculates heritability based on the genotype average. 
Now, it's important to remember that the generic variance is equal to additive variance plus the dominance variance. There is an interaction between them, but we are not be covering this now. So, in the restricted sense, heritability considers the division of the additive generic variance over the phenotypic generic variance. Now, this part is extremely important for ultimate breeding program goal, the trait of heritable interest. The additive generic variance is the part transmitted to the next generations, which is the variance of breeding values. And the most important, the heritability in the narrow sense explains most of the quantitative characteristics of crops. Heritability has innumerable applications and with the advancement of computation and molecular technologies, estimating or partitioning heritability has become a practical reality. So heritability can be predicted in the artificial selection or natural selection, for example. Also, the heritability is an important parameter that determines statistical power in gene mapping studies. The large heritability implies a strong correlation between phenotype and genotype. So large size affecting the trait can be more easily detected. This is a reality in methods that uses GWAS, the genome-wide association studies, for example. There is also the possibility of calculating the heritability of the gene expression. That is very, very nice, right? Okay, so now that we know about the difference between heritabilities, we can jump to the next steps and better understand the use of these concepts, not at the population level, but at the individual level within a population. With the concept seen above, we are going to approach the breeding equation proposed by Lush in 1943. This equation allows us to measure the increases of change in a specific trait concerning a definite unit of time. For this case, the formula has the following elements. R, that is changing the trait, means per unit of time. V, that is genetic variance. I, that is the selection intensity. R, that is the currency of selection. It could be also explained like the square root of heritability. It means the correlation between the mean of the progeny and the criteria of which selection was basic. L, the interval between successive cycles of selection. In the next slide, we are going to explain how each element of this formula works in the sense of what the breeder can do to optimize the result of R. It is important to know that R depends directly on the factor in the denominator, which means that the longer the amount of time, the lower the value of R. Also, the other factors influence the final value of R, as we will going to see in the following slide. Now, one of the most important objectives in breeding programs is to increase or improve the specific trait in the shortest time possible. To achieve this objective, we can make use of different strategies. One of them is to employ our physical knowledge, physiological knowledge of plants, for example, for example, we can increase the number of hours of light on the plant will have to reduce the vegetative and reproductive cycle in a significant way, lending to a reduction of time to achieve the next generation. On the other hand, we can use another strategy such as pseudo breeding in which the plant genetic resources of the breeding program are taken to a tropical country in a season such as winter to carry out the necessary growing cycles. For example, CIET in Colombia has different experimental stations that receive population for evaluation throughout the year from countries such as the United States and Europe. Finally, the last few years, breeding have gained a great ally, 
like omics, sequencing, and gene editing, among others. This type of technology allows plant breeding in a faster way, knowing the structure, architecture, and genetic diversity of the population, and facilitating the selection process of the individuals without the needing to complete the vegetative and cycle and the species. Techniques such as gene editing allows the introduction of a specific genes into the genome of a specific for a specific commercial purpose. As we can see, all these tools allow a circumstantial reduction in the time taken to obtain a variety, line, or clone with desired characteristics. Now in the relationship between R and time, let's now study the other factors of the formula. So first, we, keep, we will talk about selection intensity, which is defined by the number of individuals of a generation selected to prompt the next progeny. This percent of selected individuals has an important incidence in breeding programs. On the one hand, if we select few individuals, as we see in the case two, we can exhaust considerably the genetic variance for the next generation, making genetic process very difficult in the future. On the other hand, by maintaining a reasonable selection intensity, we can have enough genetic variants to continue to advance our populations. It is important to mention that tools such as genomic and molecular marker system selection considerably facilitate this part and the selection accuracy. For programs that do not have this technology, some tables allow you to have a range of selection intensity for a given specific according to previous studies. Therefore, the accuracy of selection will be related to the closeness between the estimated breeding values and the true breeding values. In a practical sense, this factor can be improved by increasing the number of replicates for each individual and testing these individuals under different environments. We hope that the content for this video will be useful for understanding some basic concepts about quantitative genetics. We appreciate your attention and share the video with other people in the area. See you in the next time or video.